Hi everyone, welcome back to the University of Guelph Arboretum. My name is Michelle and I'm the Summer Naturalist here at the Arboretum. And today I'm in the Gosling Gardens and I'm really just taking a moment to experience everything around me. I'm using my five senses to take in my surroundings. So I'm looking at those bright, beautiful flowers behind me. I'm feeling the humidity in the air. It rained earlier today. It looks like there might be a bit of more rain coming. And I'm hearing the rustling of the leaves each time the wind blows. And what's really interesting to think about is all the different ways other animals perceive their surroundings. And that's exactly what today's video is gonna be all about, the different ways animals sense the world. And us, as humans, we tend to be a very visual species. Some people are visual learners and prefer to have things explained with, to them through pictures and instead of big blocks of text. And in general, we tend to navigate the world using visual input. But what if I told you the world we see isn't the same world other animals see? And that has to do with the spectrum of light that we can see. If I asked you guys what the colors of the rainbow are, I'm sure you guys would all know the answer to that. It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And rainbow, the rainbow, what that really is, is all of the colors we can see. Any color you see is on that spectrum of colors. And it also represents the spectrum of visible light to us. But that doesn't mean that's the only light available. After violet, there comes ultraviolet. And so us as humans, we can't see ultraviolet, but other animals can. And behind me, all those flowers, to us, we see those vibrant colors, but some flowers actually look differently under UV light. So let's take a closer look at some of the flowers around me. So when we take a look at these flowers, we can of course see the different colors that would fall on a rainbow on that spectrum of visible light. But in the case of some flowers, there's actually parts of them that you can't see with your eye. So while we can't see all the beautiful colors in those flowers, we can't see what they would look like under UV light. And other animals that can't see UV light will use the patterns and markings that are shown on some flowers uh, to help them with finding nectar. And so the way that works is if you can imagine all the lights that are put up on an airport tarmac, and that helps guide the plane to know exactly where to land. And pollinators, bees tend to be the poster children of pollinators, so we'll use them as an example. Bees can see in UV light. And in the case of some flowers, they will have markings and patterns to help direct bees to the, their source of nectar. And so bees will use UV, their ability to see in the spectrum of UV light to find nectar. Now there are other animals that can see in UV light and they'll use that ability for different ways. But in the case of pollinators that seek nectar from flowers, they can use their ability to see in UV to find nectar. Now, hearing is another sense that humans heavily rely on, but we have a bit of a challenge when it comes to hearing. And that has to do with our symmetrical ears. So if you were to draw a line from one ear to your other ear, that line would meet perfectly in the middle. And having symmetrical hearing is all right. So we can hear from a distance and we can hear just fine. But what we struggle with is finding exact locations to sounds. So I don't know how well this phone picks up noise, but from my left hand side, I can hear traffic from the road. I can hear uh, trucks honking and cars going by, but I can't tell you exactly where those noises are coming from. But other animals like owls, for example, they actually have asymmetrical ears. And what that means is if you were to draw a line from one ear to another ear, it wouldn't meet up. One ear is slightly higher than the other ear. And that allows them to gather information not only from a noise is coming left and right, but also the, where the noise is coming uh, from, from an up and down perspective. And so owls can perfectly triangulate where a sound is coming from. And a lot of people, when they think of the amazing senses that owls have, they think of their eyesight. And that's true, owls have an incredible ability to see 
and low light. And that's thanks to their huge eyes that help take in a lot of light. But what if I told you there's some scenarios where an owl's ears are just as, or maybe more valuable than their eyesight? So let me paint you a picture. Let's say it's December down here in Ontario and you're standing by an open field that has a layer of snow over it. And at the edge of this field, there's some trees and an owl is sitting in that tree, waiting and watching, looking for its next meal. Now, what you can't see on the surface level of that field is that there's actually mice running down below underneath the snow. We can't see that, the owl can't see that, but what the owl can do is listen and it'll actually be able to hear those mice running below the snow. And using its asymmetrical hearing, it can actually pinpoint exactly where the mice are running. And what it'll do is it'll just swoop out over that field, stick out its strong, powerful talons and catch a meal it's never even seen. So while owls have really amazing eyesight, their hearing is just as incredible. And now it sounds like owls really have it all. They have fantastic sight, amazing hearing, but you can't have it all in nature. So owls, for example, don't have very good sense of smell and taste. And that's fine, they don't really need it. They do find uh, primarily relying on their amazing sight and hearing. And that tends to be the case for a lot of animals. They might have one really well-developed sense and another sense that they just don't need to rely on quite as heavily. A good example of that is actually porcupines. So if you ever seen a porcupine up in a tree, they actually have very poor sight. But to make up for that poor sight, they have a really good sense of smell and a really good sense of touch. The hands and feet of a porcupine actually have no hairs and no quills, and they're very sensitive to tactile response. So when that porcupine needs to climb a tree and get a, get move around, it can use the feedback from its hands and feet to be able to grip and climb a tree. And not only do they have excellent sense of touch on their hands and feet, but they actually have special hairs along their body and whiskers around their face. And those hairs are specially designed to pick up touch. So porcupines can use this to help maneuver themselves in tight spaces. They can get a good sense of where their spatial surroundings are by those very sensitive hairs around their back and on their face. And it can also help alert them to potential predators. They're very sensitive to things uh, brushing past them and touching them. So that's one way uh, porcupines make up for their uh, poor sight. You know, they're nocturnal animals just like owls, uh, but instead of developing highly uh, specialized sight for low light, porcupines, uh, they've just done fine with having poor vision and any light. Speaking of animals with poor vision, snakes are also an excellent example of an animal that has very poor vision. A snake can't see very far and the sight that it does has is really focused around movement. So they tend to pay mo most attention to things that move around. And that kind of makes sense. If you think about most snakes live their lives down low on the ground, how advantageous do you think it would be for a snake to be able to see super far away it being so low to the ground, a tree, rocks, a hill, it'll all block their vision from a distance. Uh, so they don't have very good sight and that's just perfectly fine for the type of life they live. But if you take notice of a snake's head and I, take a, I show you a picture of a snake's head up close and you take a moment to look really carefully, you'll notice they're missing something that we have. Snakes don't have ears. So their eyesight is pretty poor and they can't hear, they have no ears. And you might be wondering how on earth do snakes sense the world around themselves if they have poor vision and poor hearing, um, no hearing? Those are two senses that are really important for us. And what snakes do is they actually smell and taste the world. Is That's their primary sense. Taste and smell usually go hand in hand. If you think of a time where you've smelled a really strong odor, you can almost taste it. And that's either really great or really bad, depending on what you're smelling. But in the case for snakes, what they're doing is if you ever sit and watch a snake's behavior for a little bit, you've probably noticed that they stick their tongue out a lot, they wave it around the air, and then they stick it back in their mouth. And they do that over and over. And they're not being silly, they're not playing any games. What they're doing is they're sticking their tongue out 
they're gathering all the smell particles from the air and they're sticking it back into their mouth. They have a specialized organ called a Jacobson's organ at the roof of their mouth and they will stick their tongue up into that special organ to smell and taste the world. And while that sounds like a really funny way of smelling, if you think about the way we smell, you know, we just take a big whiff and we can smell that way. Snakes do have nose, noses, but they just only use them for breathing. And they use their tongue to smell and it sounds a bit funny, but it actually works really well for them. They have a sense of smell about 10 times better than a dog. And that's pretty impressive considering dogs already have so much better of a sense of smell compared to us. So snakes got them beat. Um, and so even though it sounds like they're at a pretty big disadvantage, not being able to see too well and not being able to hear at all, they do just fine using their really well-developed sense of smell. And some snakes, some groups of snakes, not all of them, they actually have a specialized organ for sensing heat that not even we have. They will have heat sensing pits around their face and that can help them detect uh, the heat of their prey and of their surroundings. So it's pretty amazing that snakes have this extra sense that we don't even have. Now, I know I said at the start of this video that today's was gonna be all about the different way that animals sense the world, but plants can also sense their environment. And that sounds really weird considering they don't have any eyes, ears, nose or mouth. How are they getting any input from the world? Well, what's really important for tree trees is sunlight and that goes for really any plant they all need sunlight because they use sunlight in a process called photosynthesis to create food for themselves and since sunlight is so important for them they actually have receptors on their leaves that can sense where light is coming from and that can help them grow in the direction of where light's coming from because it really serves a plant no no benefit to grow in the direction of shade so they're able to use this input to know what direction will be best for growing. And in some seeds, some seeds will actually not even germinate unless they're exposed to light. So they're able to sense if they were to germinate, if they're gonna start growing in cloudy or shady conditions, it might not be beneficial to the plant. That seed will hold off on germinating until it has uh, light, until it's exposed to light. So it's really amazing to think about the fact that plants might not have all the sensory organs that we have, but they can still uh, experience the world around themselves and use that input to grow differently. Now, I hope you guys enjoy learning all about uh, the different ways animals and plants sense the world. And I hope you'll join me next week for another video.